But what I'm hearing in terms of the bag that Gerard Mayo referenced last week, what kind of currency do the Patriots need to see coming to them? And I keep circling back to it's going to be three first round picks, meaning Minnesota at 11 and 23 and their first round pick from next year. From what I'm hearing, it's going to take a lot more than that for the Patriots to be moved off their spot. All right, that was Tommy Curran last week explaining what the bag may entail for the number three pick. Today, Curran writing on NBCSportsBoston.com that it's going to take a, quote, big, big booty, massive, historic, perhaps even bigger than the haul the Dolphins got for the number three pick from the 49ers back in 2021. Miami moved down nine spots to number 12 overall, acquiring two future firsts and a future third in the process. San Francisco went on to draft Trey Lance. We, of course, all know how that worked out well we're hearing from Tommy Curran there we know we have him on the show here he is so is Phil Perry um Curran big bag is that more than three first rounders is it four yes, is it is. It... it's more than three first rounders it's four upwards of five I think the Patriots are very much entrenched upwards of five first rounders. I mean I'm just spitballing here but they want a massive amount so you ask me what it'll be I don't know but I don't think that they're going to see it from merely three so exceed three, and then you can be in the conversation. Four, will that get it done? Well, how far down the road is that uh, next one coming? So that weighs into it as well. Five, I mean, that, to get caught you know, up on the hypotheticals, I think is less important than why. Why would the Patriots be in a position to ask that? And that's because this 2024 draft is miles different from the 2021 draft in which you were dealing with guys who were coming into the league in COVID and had multiple question marks around them. Yeah, it's a lot. And to me, it just, it's, it's more about what it says in terms of their opinion of these quarterbacks than it does about the, the hall itself. If you're not moving off the third overall pick, unless you get four or five first rounders, you love the quarterback class. You love at least three of the guys in the quarterback class, because if you didn't, then it wouldn't require that much. And so I think this is trending in the direction that we all have thought it would be trending for a while, which is they end up with whoever falls to them at number three overall, unless something happens between now. And I don't know if that decision has been determined at this point, but if that's what they're talking about in terms of a trade hall to get back in order to coax them to move down, that to me is borderline unrealistic. All right. Well, we want you to join the conversation as well. You can vote in our poll. What should the Patriots do if a team offer them four first rounders for the number three pick? Do you make that trade or do you keep it? Go to NBCSportsBoston.com slash early edition. You can also scan the QR code on the screen, scroll down to the poll and vote. Current, I know in your article you mentioned maybe the most likely trade candidate for something that big would be Minnesota, right? Because they've got 11 and 23. They desperately need a quarterback with Kirk Cousins now in Atlanta. But a haul like that, like if it's not Minnesota, and even when they make a trade like that, like literally mortgaging their future, who might want to make a trade like that? Certainly Minnesota is the prime candidate because they immediately made that deal to add another first-round pick. Additionally, Rick Spielman, the former Vikings GM, said that they're going to have to overpay for J.J. McCarthy. And I think in the context of the conversation that he was having, they were speaking specifically about getting up to number four. But that's where the Patriots have an ability here to play games with people. Uh, we want J.J. McCarthy and say the Vikings don't want Drake May and they really want J.J. McCarthy. Well, then the Patriots can threaten we're going to take him and leave you with May. So now you have to deal with Arizona. And if the Patriots really want to play it, they could trade back to four, trade with somebody and then get into a bidding war to get back to four because they've already added picks. To me, there is great opportunity for the Patriots in this draft and they can still walk out with a quarterback if those top four guys are ones they want. We just saw a move sort of similar to that one in last year's draft where Monty Osfort, for, former college scouting director in the New England Patriots, traded from three down to 12 and then back up to six, all in the matter of like a few minutes. And they were able to get the guy they wanted all along at number three overall. So that would be an enticing scenario in order to add draft capital. The reason I would get a little bit worried about that one is if you're comfortable playing those games and, and trying to make mm -hmm. all of those dominoes fall in real time, it tells me you're not in love with the quarterback. Because if you were truly in love with them, you would just take him at three, and you wouldn't risk maybe not getting him by doing this whole the, all these yeah. shenanigans of moving down and then coming back up. It's nice to think of in theory, but you need a lot of moving parts to fall into place in order for something like that to happen. I'm not going to lie, guys. I'm surprised that right now the poll is sitting at 75% of people saying make the trade versus still take the quarterback at three. Are you making that trade? I know you like. I know you love Drake May, Phil. I know you like Jaden Daniels. 
Um, I think you're a little so-so. Sure, you like J.J. McCarthy. Are you making that trade if those guys, if those three guys are, or like I suppose two of those three guys are available to you? If I believe in the quarterback, I'm not making that trade. And I personally do. I, I don't know where the Patriots are at this point in time, but I would not make that trade for four first-round picks. As many holes as this roster has to be filled right now, the reason you make a trade like that and you, and you compile all of those draft picks is because you eventually hope that you have the opportunity to draft a franchise quarterback, and then you have the ammo that you need to move up if necessary. Here, you have lucked out, in my opinion, where there is ostensibly a franchise quarterback available to you at three overall, and he's just sitting there. Take him. Mm -hmm. Don't overcomplicate it. If you don't want to play him right away, I'm open to that because maybe you think the roster is not ready for that. But get the guy, get him in-house, and develop him because that's, that's the entire goal of this whole thing, all of these machinations. Make sure you get the quarterback in order to compete. If you don't have him, you got nothing. Kurt, we what we were hearing about your article today was the Sweaty Palms article, right? Like, there's a lot of pressure on these guys. And another point you made in there was like, oh, you've got this highly paid GMO. Wait, you don't because your GM, you know, doesn't have the job right. yet. And he's sort of, he's drafting for his job. Do you trust Elliot Wolf in this situation to make the right decision? I defer to his experience, Trenny, just in the fact that he has been in front offices. He's been in multiple organizations. He has, should have been, by now, pretty much a vacuum for all the knowledge of how to operate in a draft, how to draft quarterbacks, how to make the right decisions. So he has no record of leading a draft for me to say, oh, yeah, I trust him. Because we would even spend for the last 20-odd years, do you trust Bill Belichick in the draft? There is no greater football mind that we've witnessed. And yet... Time and again in the draft, there were missteps and miscalculations and overreaches with trades out that just didn't work. So Phil's way of operating is the easiest, simplest, most foolproof way of keeping your job for the long haul. Everyone said Drake May. They were saying it from the year before. We took him. I don't know what happened once he got here. That's the easiest way to do it, to monkey around and move down and move back up and see about J.J. McCarthy when he's just washed ashore as a top pick, I think is much more dicey. But I do think if you're in this position, as Elliot Wolf is by de facto nature, you have to do what's aggressive and best for a team that is accustomed to winning and wants to rise quickly. So if the aggressiveness you think can pay off because this draft is, draft is so fat, with those players at positions of need, corner and edge, throw those in there too. Those have snuck by. Those are other positions who I think could be really applied in this draft as well. I'd make that move. There, there's question marks with all of or these I'd positions. Consider. And if you add picks just to draft a receiver and draft a tackle and add a corner, there's a chance you miss on those guys too. What I would say, even though we don't have it, Tom's right, we don't have Elliot Wolf at the top of the depth chart in terms of a personnel, a personnel department, a front office, making the pick. But we do know what he did as a number two, which was he encouraged John Dorsey, general manager in Cleveland, to take Baker Mayfield number one overall. That was a bad team. They could have traded out a number one and added picks and built for the future. They took Baker Mayfield. His dad also traded away a first-round pick from a bad Packers team to get Brett Favre, and that one ended up working out pretty well.